So again, we are talking about um, just these opportunities we have as a local church to make an impact. And of course, the areas that folks are able to serve are varied. I mean, whether it's feeding the homeless, whether it's going to nursing homes, whether it's what happens on a Sunday, uh, obviously being a small group leader, being a life group leader, all the types of things that happen uh, throughout the week. And of course, we've been talking about just biblically from the scriptures, what does God have to say about that? Um, we really want to have God's perspective about that. So I would like for us, if we could, are you all ready to get into the scriptures? All right, so if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would. And we're going to look at uh, uh, several different verses here. And for your convenience, they'll be on the screen. Uh, but uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, the extended notes are, are in there. You can, you can uh, go, to the, go to the events tab and save those if you'd like. Uh, but... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. So when we're talking about gifts, and that's why all of these are here. I didn't realize they were going to have that many, but that I love. I'm almost ready to just break out into a Bing Crosby song. Just <laughs> Christmas, right? You got to love Christmas. So they're empty, though. There's nothing in there. And uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them, but I'm going to do something with them a little bit here. But we're talking about the gifts, the gifts that God has given us. And that's what I really want to focus on uh, this morning. And the first thing I, I just want to remind us all, and I know a lot of us know this, but I think it's good to remind ourselves. Now, I want you to hear this very carefully, though, and that is we've all been gifted. We've all been gifted. Maybe you've been in a situation where you were at a party or there was an exchange of gifts. Maybe they didn't know you were going to be there or they didn't count correctly or whatever. One of those awkward moments where everybody got a gift but you and how horrible that feels. You know, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but it does happen and it can happen. I want you to know as far as God is concerned, when he was handing out gifts, he didn't look at our skin color. He didn't look at our background. He didn't look at our family. He didn't look at our failures. He didn't look at our weaknesses. He gifted everybody. Everybody matters in the heart and mind of God. And quite honestly, you know, let me, let me illustrate it this way. When, when you're in, in, in school or, or you're maybe just hanging out with your buddies and your friends and they're picking uh, teams, how many of you were the last person picked? Anybody want to admit that? Maybe I shouldn't have asked you that. That's not very, you know, you don't want to raise your hand. Uh, I was always the first one picked. No, that's not true at all. But, you know, you're the last one picked, and they realize they picked you only because they had to. Because <laughs> the teams have got to be even, you know. All right, I guess we'll take Millie. I don't know. You know she can't even run. But all right, yeah, come on over here. And then that's how it is. Like, okay, yeah. And it's just like you're just standing there like, I guess I'm over here. Man, that is a horrible feeling. Let me tell you something. God doesn't size any of us up that way at all. We're his first pick, every one of us. Come on, somebody. We're it. And he's given us gifts. So here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 12. It says a spiritual gift is given to each of us. No one has been excluded to each of us. Why? So we can help each other. See, God has given each of us a gift, and the reason behind that gift is so that we can, in turn, help one another because there's something that happens in us and in them when we actually do that, when we actually give that gift. So, so uh, the, the word charisma in the, in the Bible, it, it, that, that Greek word, uh, it's translated the word charisma that we see in this word gift. That, that word gift is actually the Greek word charisma, but it actually means something that has been given to us by God. But the idea here, first of all, that I want us to see is that he's given it to each of us. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. We're not all the same, but the same spirit is the source of them all. So, for example, to illustrate that, uh, we have people that they go into the children's ministry and they're like, man, this is, this is my area. This is my element, man. I love this. We have other folks that if you put them in a classroom with children, it wouldn't matter how many adults were there, they would just freak out or it just would be too much for them or they wouldn't know what to do or, you understand what I'm saying? Um, I have never, I've never taught, you know, like we have people that teach our elementary kids. I've never done that. I've never gone into a room full of elementary kids and taught a Bible lesson. I have never done that. And partly the reason why is because I don't think I'm very good at it. I don't think I would be good at it. You know, because you lose the little ones when you say, now the Greek word is, and that, you know, they, they just don't get that. 
My point is, is that God has given everyone a gift, but not all those gifts are the same, and that's by the design of God as well. That everyone has been gifted, but they're different types of gifts. Now, here's, the, here's again, the reason why I'm really kind of pressing on this. We sang this song earlier, No Longer Slaves, and the power of fear being broken off of our lives. I am convinced that one of the main reasons why folks don't tap into or discover what God's gifted them with and then take that next step to give that gift away is because of fear. They're afraid that they're not going to do it right. They're afraid that uh, they're going to do it wrong. They're afraid that, or uh, the devil convinces them that it really, they really don't matter, that what they have to give really isn't that significant. But here's the second point. It's really important. And that is we're responsible, folks, for the gifts that we've been given. How God has gifted us, we're responsible for that. And let me just say this. Uh, how God has gifted us determines what we do with that gift, okay? How he's gifted us determines what we do with that. And so in that, it, when I talk, mentioned the word charisma, that, that word gift, that it's, it's an endowment. It's something that God has given us. But here's actually what it says. Uh, here's what it says in um, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. It says, however, he has given each one of us a special gift through the what, everybody? Through the generosity of Christ. So Jesus, being massively generous, has given us these gifts. In other words, he didn't hold back. He wasn't measured. He didn't say, I'll just give them a little bit of this gift because I don't know what they'll do with it. If I give them all of this gift, they might not, they might not treat it well. They, no, he didn't do that. He trusted us. And says, I'm going to start off trusting them, and I'm going to give them this gift, and I'm going to give it generously. I'm going to give it full of love, full of excitement, full of enthusiasm. I'm going to give it generously. So listen, the way we've received the gift determines what we do with it. We've been given the gifts, the abilities, the skills, all of that. We've been given those, to, uh, we've received those, rather, by God, and he gave them to us generously. He didn't hold back. That determines what we do with them. That means we, in turn, give those gifts generously, and we don't hold back. Right? Does that make sense? How we've received them determines what we do with them. Well, we've received it generously. We didn't earn it. How many realize a gift? Listen, uh, well, I, can't, I don't want to get into that, but, but the gifts aren't, gifts aren't meant to be earned. Paychecks are earned. Thank you for that. Allowances are earned. So kids don't get allowances for waking up and eating and, you know, going to school and going potty. They don't get allowances for that. They get allowances for doing chores. Can I get a witness? Somebody in this house. So allowances are earned, right? Pay paychecks are earned, you know. But gifts, gifts. Birthday gifts, Christmas gifts, special occasion, whatever the gift, gifts aren't earned. We don't go to somebody and say, look, you've been really nice. See, that's the one thing I don't, my, I love Santa, but that's one of the things I don't agree with Santa about at all. Naughty list, nice, no, 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 no. With God, there is no, there, there's, it doesn't happen like that. He didn't look at us and say, you know, I see all your weaknesses, all your, all your failings, all of your, your issues, all, the th all of your imperfections, I'm not going to give you this. He looks at us and says, I'm going to give this to you generously. But gifts, so gifts aren't, aren't earned. Gifts are that, gifts. But folks, gifts only work when they're given. So you don't buy a bunch of Christmas gifts and put them in the closet and then just leave them there. And Christmas rolls around and passes by. Now we're into January and February. And we're like, man, we got some great gifts for the kids. We got some great gifts for our family. We got some, I got a great gift for Bonnie. Where is it? It's in the closet. Does she even know it's there? No. But it's a good one. Yeah, I, I you know, it's, and you know what? It's exactly what she wants, it would bless her socks off. <laughs> Does she know? No, she didn't know anything about it. I bought it. She didn't even know. I got it. I wrapped it. It's a gift. I put it in the closet. When did you get it? I bought it in October. 
but Christmas was December. I know, but it's an awesome gift. But she doesn't know anything about it, which means she never receives the benefit of it. I know this seems like so elementary, but folks, gifts are pointless. They're worthless. They don't do anything. They don't accomplish anything. They don't add anything to anybody's life in the closet. God has given us gifts generously so that we in turn will give those gifts to others generously. Gifts are meant to be given not held on to. Does that make sense, everybody? So if somebody has the gift to teach or if somebody has the gift of administration, these are gifts that are mentioned in the Bible. Somebody has the gift of mercy. Somebody has the gift of generosity. Somebody has all, if somebody has these gifts, God gives them, gives us those gifts. They're only valuable when we give them away. I think I shared this uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I've shared a couple of stories about this, this Italian violinist called Niccolo Paganini. And, and, and one of the stories I've shared before is uh, he was just this infamous, infamous, uh, legendary violinist. And when he, so, so much so that when he passed away, they took his violin and they encased it. You know, they enshrined it and they put it on a wall. What they didn't realize is the violin was made out of a certain type of wood that if it wasn't handled and used, it would quickly decay. And in a very short period of time, that's exactly what happened to this beautiful violin. It began to decay and fall apart in the glass. It kept its richness. It kept its, its, its life. The life expectancy of that violin was dependent upon it being used. You all get the analogy? The gifts that God's given us, the value of those gifts are only discovered by us and by others when we Use them. And they stay alive as a result of us using them. Otherwise, they stay in the darkness. And so there's this, so it really is this, this, this thing of generosity. It really comes down to this act of generosity. Matter of fact, that was the mark of the early church. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. It says they worshiped together in the temple every day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with one another with great joy and... There's that word again, generosity. Generosity was the mark, was a distinct mark of the early church that set the church apart from the rest of the world. The rest of the world was a little stingy. The rest of the world was concerned about what they had and they never thought they had enough to give away so they're only always holding on to what they had. The rest of the world around the church, that's how they lived. The rest of the world had their hand out to receive all the time. My name is Jimmy, 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 Gimme, Gimme, Gimme. I mean, that's how the rest of the world was, right? But the early church was so distinct from the rest of the world because they had received generously the forgiveness of their sins. They have received generously the grace of God. They have received generously joy the joy of the Lord. Are you getting this? They've received from the Lord generously, and so they just couldn't help it. They were just generous folks. They were generous with their finances, and they were generous with their gifts. They were generous with what God had given them. In 2005, there's a man by the name of Thomas Cannon. He passed away of colon cancer in a hospital in Richmond, Virginia. He was 79 years old. Now, Thomas described himself as a poor man's philanthropist. Now, Thomas never earned more than $25,000 a year his whole life. But at the end of his life, he had given away $156,000. And they say that his gifts mainly were in the form of $1,000 checks that he gave to people that either he read about that were in need or he heard about, whether it was a youth worker in a low-income apartment complex, a volunteer faithfully serving at an elementary school, a Vietnamese couple wanting to return back home, a teenager abandoned as an infant. Uh, these were some of the folks that throughout the years that Thomas was able to give. Now, he lived a certain way so that he could do that, but the motivation Behind all that was when he was in the Navy and he was working at the port in Chicago years ago. There was an explosion and several of his shipmates were killed. His life was spared. And he just kind of believed there was a reason for that. And he felt like the Lord spared his life 
so he could help others. This was the passion for his giving. Somebody wrote this book about him. The biographer that wrote this about uh, Thomas said not many, he said about Thomas, not many people would consider living in a house in a poor neighborhood without central heat or air conditioning or even a telephone and work overtime just so that they could save money in order to give it away. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? And that was... That's such a huge example, such a powerful example of generosity. Now, here's what I'm trying to say about this. In the same way, we need to be generous. That same incredible generosity that I just shared with you about this man. We need to be that generous with our gifts, with our abilities, with our talents. If we want to see the lives of others changed in the same way. And here's the thing, here's the thing about us as Christians, okay? Okay. We're wired a little bit differently than the rest of the world. Now, now we, were, we weren't like this before we came to know Christ. But when we came to know Christ, there was just kind of reprogramming of our hard drive. How many would agree with that? Now, I know there's some things we're still working to get through and get past. But there's a huge part of who we are that's been rewired by God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And part of that is we want God to use us. And we, we really get jazzed when we see us do something that changes someone else's life, even in a small way. That's just how we're wired, see. And so when we're generous with our gifts, just like Thomas was generous with his money, when we're generous in that same way and we don't hold anything back and we're really extending ourselves, then we, that's when we see people's lives change. And according to the Scriptures, by the way, according to the Scriptures, that's how we see the body of Christ in our local churches. That's how we see them grow. That's how we see more of God be felt and experienced even in our local churches. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2. He talks about us being fitted together so that when we are using our gifts, being locked in like Legos together, he says the, the whole body increases and becomes greater. In other words, we add to one another. We become greater, not necessarily in size, but we become greater in strength. How did that happen? That Well, that happened when we were fitted together or interlocked or joined together. We were connected. What connected us? Well, what connects us is when we use our gifts. That's what connects us, see. There is a, I know there's a type of connection. You come, you attend, you visit. You're a part of the church. You're part of the church family. But there's a, there's a, there's a stronger degree of connection we get when we decide to hand out a welcome guide. Or we help in a classroom. Or we feed the homeless. Or we go on a missions trip. You see what I'm saying? That we do something. We lead a life group. And all of a sudden, when we begin to connect that way, when that connects, there's something supernatural that happens. And here's what God said through the Apostle Paul. He said, this is how the church grows. It's not by one guy who's the preacher who gets up and teaches the Bible. That's not how the church grows. The church grows as, as, as everyone else takes these incredible, valuable gifts I've given them and begins to use them and locks themselves together and they start feeding spiritually off of each other's gifts. The whole thing grows. God says, that's amazing. It's powerful. That's what really changes a church and schools and neighborhoods and cities and nations. I'm telling you, right? I, I love that. Now, here's the third thing. Here's the third thing, and that is when we serve, and I kind of uh, kind of touched on this a moment ago, it awakens that eternal thing in us. And remember I said we're kind of wi we're wired differently. So in Luke chapter 16, now, again, Jesus is using finances to illustrate this point. It applies to finances, but as we're seeing, it applies to so much more. And here's, here Jesus teaches this parable, and here's, he sums it up, and he says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they'll welcome you into an eternal home. So let me trans translate that for you. Now he's talking about worldly resources, being generous with our finances, but it means more than that. So he's saying, let's look at it this way. When you and I are using our gifts, the resources that God's given us, the things he's deposited in us, when we're doing that, it benefits others and it makes friends so that when our possessions are gone, meaning when our life is over and we're not possessing those gifts anymore, 
then we'll get to heaven and we'll experience that eternal rejoicing by those whose lives have been dramatically changed through our gifts. Does that make sense, everybody? And so what I'm trying to say is that when we're generous with our gifts, when we lock in, when we, enter, when we begin to use our gifts, it awakens something internal within it. We begin to realize that what we're involved in is, some, is bigger than us. And we also begin to realize that it extends further than we can ever accomplish on our own. It's eternal. There's something eternal about it, right? The fact that you lead somebody to Jesus, like this Hendrick leading these two little kids to Jesus, how many would agree with me, that's eternal. That, the rest of their lives, they're, they, they, they can look back at that moment. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's eternal, ladies and gentlemen. That's why she was crying. That's why, we're, that's why when we see people being baptized, like we will next week, you know, I think there's like, I think 40 or so that are, that are so far that are signed up. So when we see that happening, we get so excited about that. Why do we get excited about that? Because it's eternal. When we're feeding somebody and then we share Jesus with them and we see, the, we see their hardness soften as we begin to share the love of God, there's something that awakens on the inside of us because we recognize that that's eternal. Amen. And when we're just greeting somebody and we find out that this coming to church that Sunday was the last, they were giving God one more chance because their lives were a wreck and they met a friendly face, which was yours. And they met the, and they experienced this warmth which came from you and that caused them to stay. And then they made a decision for Jesus and God literally radically changed their lives. When you're good, that's eternal, ladies and gentlemen. And we realized, I had a part in that. I had a part in that. I had, I had something to do with that. Let me close with this. Right after World War II, there in this little French village, there was a doctor there. He'd taken care of the folks for years and years and years. So it was time for him to retire. And they wanted to do something nice for him. And so what they decided to do is they, they, they all got together as a village. And they said, look, we're going to put this big barrel in the town square. And we're all going to go to our little, uh, little stash of wine that we have in our homes. And one day a week we'll come with a little pitcher and we'll, we'll just make an offering each week for several weeks of wine. A little, little pitcher of wine will all pour into this, this vat, this barrel, this container. And they did that. They did that week after week after week. They did it for several weeks, actually. I'm not sure how many, but they did it for several weeks. And, and then they were ready to present this gift to the, to the doctor, and they were excited about it. And they said, you know, we didn't know what else to give you. We didn't have a lot, so we, you know... We all had a little wine around, so we just kind of gave a little offering of wine, and this is great, you know, there it is. And he's like, oh, thank you so much. He was, you know, he was really, really warmed by that. And, and so he took the container of wine home with him, and, and uh, one night he decided to go ahead and open up that little spigot and get him a little glass of wine, and it didn't look right. And it looked really clear. So maybe it's a white wine. He drank it. It was water. It tasted like water. He drank it again, and he said, this is water. And he opened up the, the lid to the container, and he realized it was all full of water. There was no wine at all. And, and what they found out was is that everybody had a little bit of wine they could have gave, but they were kind of thinking, you know, I don't know. I think what I'll do is I don't want to look like I'm not doing anything, so I'll just give a little water. <laughs> And I'm sure my little bit of water will be just kind of overpowered by all the wine everybody else was giving, but everybody had the same idea. <laughs> Nobody thought their little pitcher was going to make any difference. The little pitcher of wine that they would bring. Not bringing it, they thought, well, that won't really matter. But I'm here to tell you today that what you have to give does matter. It does make a difference. It makes a difference to God. It makes a difference to others. And I'm telling you, it, it may, it'll make a difference in you and to you. Father, we're so thankful for how generous you are and have been and are today to us. Uh, you didn't hold anything back. You didn't hold back your grace, your, your forgiveness. We're thankful for that. You didn't hold back your love. You didn't hold back anything from us. And when you gave us gifts, we didn't earn those. You gave them to us. You chose to trust us with these abilities, these skills, these gifts, so that we could give them away. 
And Father, just continue to remind us what happens in us and what happens in others. So, honestly, Lord, what I really would like, what I'm really praying is that you would just encourage your people today that if for some reason the enemies tried to convince them that they don't matter, they're not that important, I pray today that you would encourage them and remind them that they matter to you deeply and they matter to others. And they, they have value and they have something of value that you need and that we need. And when we do that, when we give those away, it makes us better. It makes us all stronger. We all are added to and we all increase. Father, I just thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Can we thank God for his word, everybody?